So I think that we are ready to start. As you know from our program, we are continuing today with the uh, uh, topics uh, more connected to the uh, to the region and uh, with the position of the far right and nationalist right uh, in the region. As you know, as you also can see from the program, the first lecturer today is Nikola Kovratovic. Uh, Nikola is a historian from Zagreb and uh, editor. Of uh, regional portal built and also used to be editor in chief of Croatian edition of uh, Le Monde Diplomatique. Uh, the title of Nikola's lecture is The Rise of a Nationalist Europe, a Balkans Perspective. Uh, and I'll just read a few questions from his abstracts that he's going to uh, try to, 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 to answer in his uh, lecture. So, the questions are, what are the similarities and differences between nationalist politics and tendencies in the Balkans, Central Europe and the West? To which systemic contradictions are they trying to produce an answer to? And what are the possible democratic and socialist answers to it? So as you know, also know the, the procedure, the lecture will take about 40-45 minutes, then we have time uh, for Q&A and for comments. And just please, to will ask you to sign this. Uh, list of participants. So, Nicola, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the uh, invitation and uh, let me take this uh, opportunity to first congratulate the 40th birthday to Comrade <laughs> Stipe, <laughs> St <laughs> Stipe Churgut. Uh, so, the questions that uh, that Marco read uh, will uh, are also the questions that um, it's not only for me to answer, I, I will try also to articulate them maybe more clearly for the discussion so it can be a joint endeavor. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, uh, um, basically, um, in April 2015, uh, the, the British uh, weekly newspaper, The Economist, uh, published an article which was entitled, uh, Fight the Good Fight, with the Western Balkans at peace, some go abroad to look for war. So this was basically a piece that was covering uh, stories about several groups and uh, individuals from uh, countries like Croatia, uh, Serbia, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo that were at that time, so in uh, early 2015, jo joining uh, different sides in the conflicts in uh, Syria and Ukraine. And not just the title, but of course the, the story itself had, uh, was quite explicit in its interpretation of the situation, which was basically that uh, these notoriously uh, warlike tribes of the Balkan Peninsula uh, are itching for a good fight and uh, they are unfortunately unable to fulfill their, uh, uh, their uh, warring destiny at their home, so they are uh, trying to look for uh, better, better places for conflicts uh, elsewhere. And uh, in this regard, it was a somewhat uh, surprising uh, revival of the once popular eternal hatred theory, uh, especially popular uh, during the 90s and later, which basically claimed that uh, all the conflicts in the Balkans are the result of uh, unresolved historical differences and uh, uh, mentality and uh, warlike mentality of, of uh, the local uh, population. Um, what's a bit surprising in this particular article is, of course, the fact that uh, by covering actually conflicts, uh, ethnic and religious conflicts in Syria and uh, Ukraine, uh, it was clearly shown that such conflicts are not endemic to the Balkan Peninsula. And even more uh, significantly, uh, the participation of volunteers uh, from the Balkans uh, was not uh, in any case more significant uh, than the participation from other regions of the continent, such as, for instance, the British Isles or Scandinavia. And not I, in, in that I am just talking about the volunteer participation, not to not to mention the the state participation in in the mentioned conflicts. So to prove that this was not uh, that although this this was a particularly insightful article that this is not a one-off event. Only last week, uh, the same newspaper uh, struck again with a piece that was claiming. Uh, basically that the airports in the region are systematically being renamed to provoke neighbor neighboring country. Uh, the piece was covering uh, uh, Frank Tudman Airport in Zagreb, Nikola Tesla in Belgrade, and Nadim Yashari in, uh, in Pristina. Uh, and it, of course, didn't even attempt to give any 
background story uh, about the procedures of, of naming these airports, it satisfied itself by basically claiming that it's yet another in the line of many illustrations of uh, inherent, uh, inherent uh, uh, and eternal hatreds of the different ethnic and religious groups in the region. So although not necessarily less uh, cautious uh, about not being politically correct about Balkans, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, the economist is not, uh, uh, it's hardly unique, you know, in this uh, reliance on, on prejudice to explain uh, even the everyday phenomena, phenomena in, the, in the region. But perhaps the irony in, uh, in this particular case uh, is that the newspaper is called The Economist, but relies basically uh, in explaining this kind of phenomena on this sort of mentality theories. And uh, maybe even more important or dangerous that it's basically supposed and it presents itself as a sort of guide for the self-styled leader of, of the West or leaders of, of, of globalizations. But uh, in any case, there is very clearly a, a long tradition of this sort of maintain, uh, mentality theories when explaining Balkans in the West and to the West. And of course, we all know about this Oriental, Orientalism, Balkanism, and uh, uh, now much ridiculed idea, uh, uh, notion of uh, this projection, colonial projection of savagery to, to the peninsula. Uh, but uh, um, there is some uh, sort of interpretation that is seemingly more, uh, more uh, sophisticated and more modern. And uh, that is the one that claims uh, uh, that uh, then uh, the one that tries to, um, uh, how to say, uh, connect the eternal hatred theory with, uh, uh, with the explanation of why, um, why not whole history of the peninsula was um, is, is a history of, of, uh, of, uh, of war and conflict. Um, uh, and in, in this uh, regard, um, it argues that uh, antagonisms uh, have only been and can only be suppressed, these inherent antagonisms can only be suppressed by authoritarianism. And by this, this sort of theory tries to explain uh, why uh, for instance, 45 years of Yugoslavia have not been a uh, uh, history of war, uh, of socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, and I think even more importantly, it tries to serve as a sort of legitimation uh, for, uh, uh, for this uh, um, prolonged uh, foreign control of the parts of the region, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, this idea that only authoritarianism uh, can uh, uh, quiet down this uh, uh, in, in uh, eternal and uh, uh, unresolved, uh, unresolvable conflicts in the region goes very much against the, uh, the history of the region. Uh, we could uh, even argue that most of the democratic uh, movements since the early modern times uh, have actually been movements uh, that attempted to cross uh, uh, both ethnic and even before the notion of ethnicity, religious uh, religious boundaries. So, in this regard, if unlike you know the economist, we try to understand the the logic behind behind the conflicts, and especially uh, the logic behind the uh, eternal hatred na narrative that uh, and th what it is trying to hide, uh, we should attempt uh, uh, we should make an attempt at a, at a materialist uh, method. So, just to go to the source of this uh, revival of eternal hatreds and powder keg. Uh, uh, theories uh, is uh, of course uh, that is of course the wars in the 90s that uh, raged especially, especially in former Yugoslavia, and uh, which were at that time uh, used to construct this uh, opposition of uh, uh, seemingly you know post historical uh, West that uh, lived through its uh, end of history and uh, end of ideologies and at, uh, end of uh, narratives like national narratives on the one hand. And uh, this construct this West in the opposition to uh, inherently uh, nationalist Balkans that was uh, that was still um, somehow engulfed in in this conflict that that uh, seemingly uh, belonged to the past. Uh, of course, when trying to exp to use this sort of explanation uh, on um, uh, on the wars in former Yugoslavia. We are immediately um, uh, we immediately uh, encounter a problem 
uh, and that basic uh, in in the basic fact that, uh, of course, as we all know, uh, modern warfare is a rather uh, complicated activity that, uh, contrary to belief in many circles, cannot be conducted by simply ha hitting somebody intensely through several, several generations. Uh, what I'm trying to, uh, to, to, uh, to make a point is that uh, the wars, the concrete wars, were in fact very well organized and prepared uh, um, Acti um, um, projects uh, by the Republican uh, in the sense of uh, constituent republics of former Yugoslavia and later national leadership. And uh, its preparation and organization had a very huge participation by the security apparatus, by the old and the new regime, of course. Um, and what that implies is uh, that uh, the wars were basically a consequence of the political uh, decisions rather than an expression of uh, eternal and uh, unchangeable popular traits of, of uh, nations in the, in the region. Uh, and in this regard, uh, of course, uh, it's important to note that uh, there are uh, uh, <clears throat> that the wars in the, 90, in the early 90s were a, a direct, um, uh, unquestionably a very direct result of the prolonged uh, crisis of, from the uh, early 80s, which, as has been noted many uh, times, in, especially in the last few years, uh, this crisis was expressed uh, first and foremost during the late 80s uh, through uh, uh, economic uh, conflicts such as uh, numerous worker strikes, but even inter-republic uh, sanctions and other sorts of um, uh, other sorts of uh, uh, disputes, uh, rather than uh, some sort of grassroots ethnic ethnic uh, uh, quarrels, and that is of course not to say that ethnicization and you know this sort of medieval folklore. Uh, was not a part of ideological legitimation of these conflicts, but one could argue that it actually came uh, uh, came somewhat uh, after the the um, the, the this uh, this economic conflicts through, through for instance strikes and sanctions. <clears throat> so. Uh, what was, um, we could um, pose a question, you know, what was this uh, long Yugoslav uh, crisis uh, about? And uh, in a very uh, abstract uh, uh, sense, we could argue that uh, it, it came about from these uh, attempts or the questions how to solve the development puzzle uh, through the socialist project, uh, which implies both internally and externally. Uh, externally, of course, how to um, uh, cut this uh, 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 prolonged um, pre-socialist uh, economic dependence, how to uh, produce local, uh, how to um, organize uh, lo uh, local, uh, develop uh, lo local uh, means of production. And by that, uh, in, uh, in the scope of the socialist project, how to uh, make this sort of uh, uh, development uh, um, uh, rather territorially, um, ter uh, territorially, how to say, um, to cover to cover most of the uh, most of the the, the, the territory. Um, so, in essence, some of the specificity of the of the uh, Yugoslav socialist model, as we all know, but uh, should perhaps just quickly go through here. Of course, the, uh, maybe the first. Um, Noticeable um, divergence from the earlier models was this abandoning of uh, we could uh, perhaps call the Soviet model of this accumulation from the countryside by uh, collectivization, uh, which served as a sort of starting point uh, of of a specific uh, of the attempts to find a specific uh, uh, specific path uh, to a sort of um, socialist modernization. Um, and uh, perhaps we are uh, in the last few years approaching a sort of, uh, maybe to call it ambitiously, uh, consensus on um, something uh, which uh, we could call post-Yugoslav post Marxist uh, historiography, historiography, that most of the contradictions that came out of the uh, Yugoslav attempts to, of building socialism were subsequently uh, tried to be, uh, were, uh, they were attempted to be resolved uh, by further market, uh, on one hand market reforms and on the other hand administrative uh, decentralization. 
since the uh, mid 50s until the eight, uh, late 80s in several uh, waves. Um, it seems that this sort of uh, logic of one hand uh, um, uh, trying to provide a market solution for, for the uh, in, a, uh, in uh, contradictions and problems in, uh, in uh, uh, Yugoslav model, uh, and on the other hand, this administrative decentralization to somehow compensate for the regional disbalances was uh, constant as a solution. Of course, this opens many questions. For instance, uh, questions about what was the role of the self-management? Uh, was it purely disciplinary? And, uh, was it emancipatory, etc., etc.? Et and of course, these are uh, many uh, questions concerning the what are the true? Are there really true fundamental differences between the Yugoslavian model and the Eastern Bloc? But this, of course, will not be covered here. Uh, because we have uh, uh, other uh, more urgent questions. Uh, so I will just uh, quickly conclude that uh, arguably both of these solutions, both mar market reforms and administrative decentralization, uh, during time basically compounded uh, both the problems of this uh, external dependence, especially in the 80s. Uh, uh, with uh, you know this uh, IMF credits, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but also uh, on the other hand, they compounded this problem of uh, internal differences, and uh, it is often quoted that uh, uh, this um, Kosovo-Slovenia discrepancy is uh, uh, the, um, the, the growing uh, differences between Kosovo and uh, Slovenia, for instance, that early 70s, uh, that, that um, late 60s, uh, that um, the, the developmental differences between Slovenia and Kosovo actually grew during the last 30 years or 25 years of, of the Yugoslav um, of the Yugoslav uh, socialist system, rather than being reduced. Uh, so there are many examples of uh, um, of uh, this uh, development, uh, this, this unequal development both in terms of uh, Yugoslav dependence uh, of, on, uh, on the world capitalist system, but also, on the other hand, this unequal development inside um, the Yugoslav Federation itself, which were uh, expressed, for instance, by this uh, socialist unemployment and you know, export of uh, excess labor power, uh, more similar to, to Greece and Turkey than uh, other socialist country, but also internally, uh, we have this sort of uh, d development of uh, imports of uh, from the le less developed parts of the country, uh, imports, you know, uh, uh, imports of good, uh, exports of uh, raw material, and imports of capital, exports of labor, etc., etc. Uh, of course, uh, the Yugoslav system, uh, although relying uh, many times on uh, basically the market uh, uh, market uh, solutions for this kind of problem, also had its own, so, so to speak, structural and solidarity fo funds, and also tried to use uh, uh, other methods, especially uh, these uh, uh, attempts to um, support or to um, subsidize, subsidize investment from the richer uh, companies from the from the richer republics to the to the less developed uh, countries, but we could perhaps conclude that these sort of solutions were vastly ine inadequate, despite their proclamations. One of the um, uh, maybe uh, interesting illustrations of the um, how to say expressions of this uh, uh, developmental dilemma in the former Yugoslavia is the Marko Veselica Stipe Šuvar. Uh, debate. Um, so Marko Veselica is a nationalist, um, uh, is a nationalist economist. While Stipe Šuvar in the early 70s was not a very high ranking, but later became a very high rank ranking uh, uh, Communist Party uh, official. So in this uh, uh, in this polemic, uh, Marko Veselica uh, tried to argue that the richer republics, by paying inside the uh, solidarity and uh, structural funds, are actually being uh, exploited by the least developed uh, parts of the federation. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, uh, Stipe Šuvar, which illustrate also the um, good reception of this sort of dependency uh, theory uh, in uh, inside Yugoslavia in that in that area, uh, try to uh, argue uh, quite on the uh, contrary and uh, argued that uh, you know this uh, export of uh, capital from the richer republics is actually and the growing differences are actually uh, 
are actually what uh, the perceived uh, richness uh, of, of, the, of the rich uh, republics is, is constructed upon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, and I mean, all of this is uh, happening on the backdrop, uh, backdrop of revolt and conflicts in the poorest region, and that is Kosovo, which also finds its expression as a, uh, as a sort of national, uh, national revolt. But not to go into, into more details about this, because this is not the, uh, maybe uh, perhaps the, the most important issue. So let's ask the question, why is all this, this history of uh, Yugoslavia, why is all this uh, relevant? Uh, well, not surprisingly, uh, many of these uh, issues uh, um, unavoidably remind us of some of the, we can draw some parallels with the, some of the polemics uh, inside the EU. EU. Um, and uh, what is sometimes, uh, what is now more and more often called uh, called the European crisis. Uh, so, I mean, of course, the uh, immediately uh, noticeable irony behind all this is that, uh, you know, this sort of uh, uh, Balkan wars and uh, ethnic conflicts were uh, earlier seen as a sort of uh, exception, you know, as a sort of left behind region. Um, in a world which is um, more and more leaving behind the, the sort of uh, national quarrels, uh, this sort of post-historical world that doesn't concern itself with such issues, which is basically living uh, in a in a, a free trade world that magically um, that magically uh, dissolved all these uh, dif difficult questions about the, the development uh, strategy. So if we look at the level of uh, um, national uh, conflicts uh, and conflicts about nationalism inside the EU, uh, we could perhaps say that you know, the history caught up with this, the, the notion of post-history. Of course, we, we shouldn't in any way exaggerate. There are very large differences between uh, socialist Yugoslavia and the EU, not just in the fact that we are talking on the one hand about socialism and, and state, and on the other hand on the trade, about the uh, trade, basically a trade union. But uh, uh, I, uh, the, tra uh, the common market and um, uh, different sort of uh, political union. Uh, and of course, uh, even more importantly, there are generally significant uh, differences in the global contexts and you know, stru structural rules and, and purposes. But uh, nevertheless, it could be argued that the, the unequal development is clearly at least one of the causes of, of the rising nationalism, uh, although in, a very different, in very different ways. Uh, so, uh, in a way, this uh, uh, idea of a European crisis, uh, idea of um, problems in, in, uh, uh, in this concept of uh, um, uh, European Union uh, as, a, as a sort of, uh, end of end of European nationalism, uh, tried, uh, started to, uh, to break down, especially uh, during the financial uh, crisis 2008 and 2009, um, especially uh, around the question uh, of Greece. As you all remember, the questions that arose were, you know, basically whose fault are uh, the, the consequences of structural fa failures of the common market to basically provide this sort of social transfers and solve these balances and deficit. Of course, uh, there were several sorts of uh, answers to this question. Uh, the, um, the most popular was, of course, that uh, the, it's the Greeks' fault uh, themselves for, you know, not cu cutting their spending enough, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which um, somewhat surprisingly, basically, um, s revived some of the, um, some of the prejudice and uh, intolerances, uh, intolerant speech, which towards uh, especially Greek, but uh, even more generally Mediterranean people, which was somewhat unexpected. It was perhaps not so, so much pronounced earlier until the, the, the Greek crisis, but it then spread like wildfire. It was, uh, uh, how to say, and perhaps to a point it still is a sort of uh, uh, common sense uh, in, the, in the north on, of Europe to, to have this um, characteristic uh, prejudice about the Mediterranean people and their uh, ability to save or work hard. <clears throat> 
which of course have nothing to do with the, which cannot be proved by any empirical data. Uh, of course, this sort of Greek blaming had a, a different expression in the, west, uh, in the West and the East of the continent. Um, and in the West, we have this um, sort of uh, uh, attempts, um, especially with the rise of uh, alternative for Deutschland, which was uh, an alternative for Germany, which was uh, mentioned several times yesterday. Uh, to try to uh, answer this uh, this problem uh, by you know um, a sort of abandoning uh, attempts to uh, suggestions even to abandon uh, uh, abandon the euro um, by basically claiming uh, that uh, the Germany uh, even uh, without its uh, stricter monetary uh, connections with the rest of the continent can still and even perhaps more successfully uh, continue with its uh, so-called neo-mercantilist uh, project that is, uh, uh, um, how to say, uh, maintaining its, uh, its uh, trade, uh, um, trade surplus. surplus, yes, sorry, uh, its trade su surplus uh, to the rest uh, of the continent. In the East, the answer was, <laughs> because the East, of course, doesn't have the surplus, uh, uh, the, the, the answers was, uh, on the periphery were, were some, somehow different. different. Um, so it was argued, uh, by, of course, by the politicians and by the elites, uh, that um, you know, we, the East, are uh, somehow a, a better disciplined part of the EU periphery and thus deserved uh, more uh, political uh, recognition and, and, and advantages. Uh, advantages. Of course, there were also, it should be mentioned, uh, other sorts of uh, types of uh, attempts at explanation, uh, also that it's the fault of the lack of transfer, uh, social transfer mechanism itself. Uh, and it was argued uh, most perhaps noticeably by uh, former Greek um, economy, uh, f uh, finance minister uh, Yanis Varoufakis that you know, uh, if EU wants to be a communi uh, community, it should organize some sort of a uh, joint, uh, uh, joint uh, uh, budget uh, to, to provide uh, these mechanisms. But I will uh, come to this a bit later. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, even if uh, currently most of the debates uh, in the EU are um, organized around the question how to reorganize Europe uh, after Brexit. That's uh, the official, the most popular, uh, currently most popular official articulation of the, of the question. Uh, but it could be argued that uh, it's, uh, in fact, a clear continuation, uh, continu continuation of a, a much longer uh, crisis of, of Europe. Uh, in this regard, uh, uh, a much longer um, crisis of Europe, which uh, is not uh, merely connected um, with political issues, uh, but uh, also these uh, contradictions of the current uh, uh, developmental uh, strategies. So in this regard, we could also argue that the so-called migrant uh, crisis, although it perhaps served as an accelerator, uh, it was uh, accelerator of the European crisis. It was hardly so because of this, uh, you know, uh, cultural uh, or religious or whatever, uh, racial or whatever other reasons. And uh, it perhaps served as an accelerator more because it uh, actually uh, made these issues about uh, European uh, solidarity, you know, uh, uh, as a... Um, uh, um, and uh, solidarity in, in terms of uh, unequal development as a much uh, it put put some of the issues in the forefront the forefront um, but uh, basically uh, uh, just to just to cover this uh, quickly uh, the, uh, inside this debate about uh, where is europe going after breakfast uh, brexit <laughs> excuse <me. laughs> uh, this is, this is a, a, as I understand, this is a very common uh, mis mistake in, in uh, Britain also when pronouncing Brexit, uh, probably by, by hungry people. Um, so uh, basically, there are sever several sol solutions that are uh, currently uh, floated by the powers that be, especially in the center, in the, in the Western uh, Europe. Uh, one of them uh, is how to solve this uh, uh, the, uh, discrepancies between different parts of Europe. Uh, 
uh, such as the one that produced um, the, the Greek crisis. One of the, uh, one of the answer is, as we all know, this uh, sometimes called federalist, this sort of uh, stricter uni uh, union with greater fiscal and mo monetary discipline. But also failing that as a sort of res uh, reserve option uh, is this, you will not be surprised, administrative diversification, uh, which is what is sometimes uh, called this uh, multi-speed uh, Europe. Uh, which is basically an attempt to, to uh, that through uh, political decentralization, um, you could uh, resolve uh, some of the conflicts concerning developmental strategies inside the Union without in any, uh, in any aspect, uh, aspect endangering the concept of the common, of the common uh, market. So in any case, you know, um, uh, from the West, especially common market and its logic cannot be questioned, uh, but only the political, growing political differences could be uh, eased, you know, by uh, this sort of political um, diversification and decentralization. And in this regard, of course, with the, with the large, very large grain of salt, we could draw some parallels with uh, discussions inside the Yugoslav Federation about how to, uh, how to uh, resolve these uh, de developmental issues and especially issues of unequal development uh, by, you know, uh, um, um, strengthening the market uh, mechanisms, but at the same time, you know, uh, trying to d diversify and decentralize the, the pol uh, political uh, structures and uh, levels of political uh, decision making. Um, and I mean, um, of course, uh, options, solutions that are different from, from these two, you know, the stricter union on one hand and multi-speed Europe on the other hand, um, are often, uh, any solution that is different from this, are by the uh, current uh, European elites uh, called, uh, as a, uh, used as a derogatory term, simply nationalism. Uh, and uh, so this is um, this is a sort of uh, liberal presumption, you know, that um, uh, well, um, how to say, um, officially uh, official liberal presumption, you know, that the common market, you know, is a area of is a mechanism of, of mutually uh, beneficial uh, cooperation. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, regardless of how. Um, the European elites are trying to solve uh, the, the current issues. It seems that this earlier uh, premise is, um, is starting to be um, perhaps um, slowly abandoned. Um, and one could argue that both this uh, um, federalist and multi-speed Europe are, are in fact, uh, that are floated by, by the, um, uh, Western European uh, leaders are, in fact, you know, uh, just mechanisms to, uh, to strengthen uh, this sort of uh, so-called neo-mercantilist project, and uh, in fact, um, that are you that are um, mechanisms to maybe ease uh, their um, their uh, projects of uh, maintaining their. Um, uh, trade surpluses with the uh, rest um, of the continent. And of course, I mean, in, in this uh, regard, they're clearly uh, uh, very much deeply nationally uh, selfish. Even, even if they're uh, mostly presented as a, as a sort of alternative to nationalism. Uh, so that's, that's what's concerning the, the, the West of the Europe. I think that the... Um, Projects uh, in the other parts of the uh, of the Europe are quite differently di different, uh, mostly because I think they have much less say about uh, how how uh, these questions will be resolved in the first place. So let's first look at the example of uh, Central Europe, especially uh, Visegrad uh, countries. So um, some. A lot of us already mentioned uh, yesterday about this uh, uh, Visegrad countries. I will try not to um, uh, repeat uh, too much, but uh, 
maybe just to highlight some of, some of the some of the issues. So <clears throat> basically, uh, Central European countries and Visegrad uh, group countries were um, used uh, was uh, was were before used as a sort of example of this example as as a proof as a. Um, Yes, is an illustration of this uh, of, of the correctness of this post-historical narrative. So the story went, you know, uh, they uh, ma basically managed to come of, out of their uh, ideological uh, past, and by this uh, became uh, successful members of this uh, post-nationalist West, um, exactly by um, by. Uh, um, applying a specific uh, developmental uh, strategy, uh, which um, uh, a specific uh, a developmental uh, strategy, uh, which um, included or which uh, which was based basically on this set of measures, um, occasionally. Called um, especially before you know, this Washington uh, Washington consensus measures with large uh, large um, levels of um, differences between the specific countries, but I, I will not go into these details. I don't think it makes sense uh, anymore. And uh, uh, in any case, um, I am talking more about the ideological representation of the, of their uh, path than, than of their concrete uh, path. Uh, but uh, in any case, so um, what's important is that they were early uh, used as an illustration of a successful transition from a, a ideological totalitarian past through this sort of uh, free uh, post-nationalist uh, free market uh, uh, Western world. Uh, of course, the irony is that now is exactly the same countries that are most often used as illustrations of the worst sorts of nationalism in. Uh, in uh, Europe, especially on the level of uh, European Union. So basically, if we are to um, to attempt to pr provide an answer of what happened, uh, which is uh, a question that, as far as I uh, uh, noticed, uh, none of the liberal uh, media uh, has been, um, although there is a very, very great uh, interest, there have been uh, very few uh, coherent answers to the question of what actually happened. How is it possible that this, um, that these countries that were uh, used as good examples have now become the, the most problematic countries? Um, of course, the most popular, uh, the most popular um, attempt at uh, explaining this is, of course, that they unfortunately never truly get uh, got out of the totalitarian past and mentality is, even if uh, even it seems so a little bit for a few years, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seemed yes. <laughs> but in any case, something happened when generational change came about. Then this sort of almost biologic biological traits returned for what whatever reason. Anyway, we will not uh, satisfy ourselves with this sort of explanations. We will attempt at something different. Uh, so, I mean, of course, there are uh, great differences in uh, the uh, late socialist development of these then three, now four countries. But um, we could perhaps generally uh, say that, especially in Poland and Hungary, the late socialist period was, uh, in fact, um, very strongly uh, marked uh, by uh, this uh, socialist austerity uh, measures, um, which were also a part of the, the policy, late socialist policy of many other countries. But Poland and Hungary are somehow also good examples of um, uh, very good examples of uh, a very uh, strong uh, influence of. Uh, um, this sort of market solutions for, for the late uh, socialist crisis, even, even better, uh, perhaps, than Yugoslavia. So this sort of uh, and, and, uh, enthusiasm for liberalization and pro, uh, pri privatization, of course, continued very much uh, in the early 90s and early 2000s. Uh, 
Uh, and very often by the same parties that, of course, now reform themselves as a sort of new left. <clears throat> and um, what their developmental strategy was uh, based upon, if we could generalize, was uh, basically, um, of course, this uh, liberalization in and uh, privatization in uh, an attempt uh, to uh, make a country uh, competitive for um, for uh, foreign direct investment, uh, that is uh, this uh, characteristic sort of um, um, what's occasionally called race to the bottom. Uh, that is an attempt to uh, make uh, uh, to uh, make uh, uh, by harming its own uh, uh, working class. Uh, making the potential rate of profit for uh, a foreign capital higher than in neighboring countries. Let's say it like this. Um, and um, as you know, I mean, uh, Central European countries uh, were in part, seemed in part to be um, successful uh, at this attracting uh, part of uh, less production, but uh, sometimes production, but even more like this secondary logistical uh, type of um, activities from the West to the, uh, not to every part of the country, but to, to very specific parts of this country. So in every one of these four countries, so Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, and Slovakia, there is um, historically unprecedented levels of uh, unequal development, this uh, dif social differences, econ economic differences between different parts of the country, specifically West and East parts of the country, uh, are uh, immense and growing. And there is very, as far as I know, very little, uh, uh, very little attempts to answer this, uh, this problem, although it's uh, started to, to become, um, to become very clear because, of course, uh, for these logistical purposes and little less for, for the production purposes, Western parts of the country in a situation where you have uh, generally very, uh, very low wages, uh, Western parts of the country for transport reasons, etc., are much more attractive for, for foreign investment. And of course, it's uh, much more difficult to, uh, inside this strategy, to make uh, geographically more remote parts of the country as attractive as attractive to foreign investment. Uh, of course, uh, this then begs the question, uh, uh, what was the, this national turn of Central uh, Europe uh, all about? Well, we could argue that it is precisely on the backdrop of this failed strategy of liberalization that managed to attract a sort of investment in specific parts of the country. But of course, uh, had this, um, uh, but made the country competitive in this uh, sense of attracting foreign investment. But that didn't, of course, translate in uh, higher living standards exactly because the strategy was based on systematic uh, lowering of, uh, of wages and, uh, and levels of social uh, security. But why nationalism then? Why, why was nationalism uh, uh, an expression of dissatisfaction with the failures of such a strategy? I would argue that uh, 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 this nationalism has several uh, uh, purposes, uh, at least on a rhetorical level. Of course, one is uh, ideological. By nationalist rhetoric, uh, it, it is an attempt to answer the need to provide a sort of ter ter territorial cohesion in the face of the growing regional differences in terms of developments between different parts of the country. And also, on the other hand, um, uh, nationalist, uh, nationalist rhetoric, at least, was an attempt to uh, resolve the need to provide the social co cohesion exactly because of the uh, uh, destroyed uh, social security system. And with this uh, ethnic community uh, as a um, uh, ref referent and you know, a family as a, as a social network in the context of lack of state-funded social network, served as a, as a, as a kind of uh, alternative uh, 
to uh, as a kind of a solution uh, for uh, for the failures of exactly of of the developmental strategy taken on in the early 90s and this was uh, also mentioned before uh, yesterday especially as a sort of uh, you know privatization of of the care and reproduction um so this is the uh, i would say the uh, ideological purposes of this nationalist rhetoric but also i think it must be admitted that uh, the nationalists turn of many of the parties in the Central uh, Europe also signaled to a point partial uh, redefining you know, of the development strategy itself, uh, but not as a U-turn, but more as a sort of accommodation to, the, to its past uh, inadequate results. So of course, again, there, is very, there are very huge differences between different countries of the Central Europe but one could very generally argue that there were some shy movements to local consumer and you know this national bourgeoisie protection, especially uh, with the banks uh, and the uh, um, credit system. After uh, enthusiastic uh, privatization of, uh, of the bank system, there were some attempts to um, legally limit the terms of um, credit, the, the terms of credit terms of. Uh, uh, for, for also for the local consumers and, and for the national bourgeoisie. So there is a sort of recognition that something went, went wrong with the former, um, former model. But on the other hand, you could also argue that model basically still, even after um, five or ten or even longer years of the rule of this uh, supposedly, you know, this sort of nationalist uh, governments that promised uh, a sort of difference. Uh, you could argue the model is basically stayed the same. They haven't thought of any anything uh, uh, specifically new or uh, much different. Uh, it still relies on this sort of competitiveness and foreign di direct uh, investment. Uh, but the governments occasionally seem to be uh, asking for a fairer and more equal, uh, equal treatment uh, in, uh, in the context of um, common market. Uh, now, I mean, uh, to, to go to the mar uh, uh, migrant crisis as a sort of uh, illustration of how this um, contradictions of the current uh, uh, development strategy are strategies are being uh, articulated as a nationalist conflict so from from the perspective of central europe of course first we uh, cannot ignore and we have to uh, mention that the rhetoric used by all of the visegrad group countries was an illustration of you know truly abhorrent racism uh, and that there can be absolutely no question about this. But at the same time, you could argue that it was also an attempt to articulate this conflict uh, about uh, European uh, solidarity through the issue of acceptance of, of refugees. So basically, how does this conflict uh, uh, turn out? So Germany requests uh, the sharing of bur uh, burden of uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, refugees. Uh, and Visegrad countries uh, refuse to accept that they have the obligations because uh, they refuse to accept that they have the obligations of caring for, for the Middle Eastern countries by claiming that they themselves, their, their citizens themselves, are significantly uh, poorer and they themselves are in need of assistance. Uh, um, and have in this regard preferences to uh, to refugees from Middle East. So Visegrad countries refuse to accept this. And in this situation, uh, Germany and other Western European uh, countries to a lesser degree threat, uh, uh, make a threat at, at cutting uh, social and other funds, structural funds for the Central European countries to withhold the money from the structural funds. And I think that this is a, a very uh, illustrative uh, or very significant that uh, how this conflict was played out. So at this point, 
I, I specifically noticed the uh, statement by uh, uh, the Polish foreign minister uh, Witold Waszczykowski, who points out uh, that structural funds are not a gift to the Central European countries, as they are often uh, conceived in the West, but quite to the contrary, they are a compensation for the common market. Uh, that is, uh, the common market clearly, uh, uh, the, the um, companies, the capital of the most developed countries clearly benefits from the co common market. So that clearly shows that the Central European countries have a, so, somehow a shift in the understanding of the common market itself. So they no longer see it as a um, mechanism for uh, equal and, um, how to say, for mutual benefit of everybody. They clearly see it as a mechanism beneficial to the most developed countries. So in this regard, they ask for compensation through a structural, structural fund. Uh, so, I mean, while the, these racist remarks were most uh, visible part of it and most irritating part of this debate, you know, I, I would argue that b the, behind this there is clearly a conflict about different development strategies to a point, you know, uh, or if you want this sort of, you know, national competitions for, for scarce resources. Uh, of course, uh, if there is a shift in the concept, uh, in the understanding of the common market in the Central Europe, uh, here in the Balkans, what is most easy to, um, to notice is there is clearly no such shift in countries like Croatia or Serbia. Uh, quite on the contrary, they are still insisting on this uh, on the earlier uh, uh, strategy of competitiveness and attracting foreign uh, direct investment uh, through this sort of um, race to the bottom. Uh, and I mean, even uh, the latest illustration, of course, uh, I mean, uh, on a rhetorical level uh, from the Serbian government, this is an everyday statement, you know, everyday mantra that this is the development strategy for Serbia. In Croatia, um, this uh, uh, recent uh, announcement uh, of attempts to introduce Euro were in fact an illustration of the same dedication to the same strategy. It was a sort of uh, idea that even if there is a multi-speed Europe, we will endeavor to be uh, the part of the uh, first Europe by insisting not on this sort of rethinking of development strategy, by, but by insisting of the, on the original strategy of uh, race to the bottom. So um, uh, it seems that you know, this sort of strategy is actually at, at its height in, in, uh, uh, in the former Yugoslavia. But at the same time, you could hardly say that this um, doesn't produce uh, nationalist or socialist conflicts. So it is not the conflict with the West, or at least this rhetorical conflict with the West in the Balkans, contrary to uh, Central Europe, that is producing this sort of nationalism. But you could argue that it's exactly the race to the, to the bottom strategy, the idea of competitiveness, this um, idea, uh, this competition about who will be uh, the one that will uh, promise the biggest uh, profit margins in the region and uh, to the foreign capital and by that becoming the, uh, become the leader of the uh, leader of the region that is producing this kind of constant rhetorical conflicts between especially uh, Serbia and, and Croatia. So even if it's articulated completely differently, or uh, to a large part differently for, uh, from the, the, the nationalism articulated in Central Europe, it is again, I would argue, the contradictions of the development models that are um, producing uh, the nationalism, the nationalist argumentation uh, in, the, in, in this uh, region. Uh, Okay, so to um, 
move to the conclusion, we could argue you now that east, west, central, and periphery, uh, it's exactly that national quarrels, you know, this uh, are the result of, of the contra uh, contradiction of the development strategies in the market conditions. And I think uh, it's also another good illustration is this uh, uh, conflict about detached uh, labors. Um, so, detached, detached. De detached. That, that's the term, huh? Upučeni radnici. Depešta. Aha, depešta. Posted. Posted, posted. Ok, sorry. Uh, posted workers. Um, it's the... Um, so, I mean, uh, this was, uh, uh, as most of you know, this was a sort of uh, mechanism uh, to uh, use the, um, the differences in uh, wage uh, um, amounts in different parts of the, of the union. So it basically means that a Croatian company can build a, a building uh, in Germany uh, by paying its workers from Croatia the, uh, the uh, salary that they would basically get in Croatia. So Croatian standard salaries. So there, uh, there is this uh, conflict uh, about um, the future of this, uh, this concept. Uh, but it's hardly uh, articulated through the um, interest or um, unsatisfactions with the labor conditions. It would seem that it's more articulated through, um, um, how to say, um, unsatisfaction, uh, dissatisfaction uh, by the Western capital about um, unloyal, competi unloyal competition. Unloyal, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say unloyal competition from the East. So you have this uh, conflict that uh, several uh, Western European countries, especially, for instance, France, is trying to uh, put a stop to this sort of practice, while on the other hand, several Eastern European countries are insisting on this mechanism, which is um, especially exploitative for to its own citizens by arguing that this is, this uh, low wages is basically the only uh, uh, mechanism or the only, the only advan market advantage they have in, in, this, uh, in this common, in this, uh, common uh, market. Um, okay, I mean, um, so I mean, uh, there is, uh, on the different levels, there is this um, question about how to uh, how, how to uh, solve um, the question of um, equality um, equality in in Europe. Uh, but I mean, I think that this uh, conflict also illustrates, uh, you know, this contradiction of the concept of social Europe in uh, market condition. If providing uh, common uh, and equal uh, uh, social protection can actually uh, make this sort of disbalances inside the common market between capital from the East and the West even more pronounced than it is, than it is uh, today. Okay, um, I'm now moving to, to, to the very end. Um, I would just like to conclude that, of course, uh, you know, this sort of unequal development is uh, far from being, you know, it's not the only source and not the only function of the far right in general. Um, I mean, it has different functions in very different contexts. So it very often tries to uh, push, you know, balance of power from one faction of the establishment to the other. It tries to reverse, you know, these uh, specific segments uh, of the modernizing process, exactly for for the distrib for uh, different distribution of of uh, power, um, and I mean it also in a way tries to um, reposition, you know, parts of the classes in this uh, sort of division of power. With, but I think without always uh, necessarily without endangering you know this uh, system as a whole, and I think that 
this is why it occasionally also manages to attract uh, uh, this sort of um, uh, support from, from the, the workers with this uh, nativism. It actually tries to present as, as uh, defending the um, material interest of a, segment, of a segment of the class. But, of course, because it can play all these very different functions, in uh, different countries it can take very uh, specific forms. And this is uh, in this um, produces the constant you know differences uh, in uh, sometimes puzzling differences in uh, rhetorics so sometimes as was mentioned uh, as was explained yesterday sometimes the far right uh, has uh, social chauvinist um, suggestions that are quite clearly in its in contradiction with its uh, strongly neoliberal um, uh, economic agenda. Sometimes the, far, the European far right has very different uh, opinions about the, the Jews. Sometimes even it has different opinions about the Muslims. It has uh, different agendas about uh, foreign policy, connections to Russia and to USA. And all of this uh, is very often very confusing. So we feel obliged to make this uh, uh, we, we recognize it as the same sort of far-right project, but in a way these huge differences between specific agendas confuse us, and then we attempt to make this sort of uh, geographic or ideological or whatever sort of uh, uh, classifications which, were, which would enable us to move more easily through, through this labyrinth of, uh, of, of the uh, far-right nonsense. But I mean, this is of course useful because we cannot ignore the differences function that far right plays um, in different countries. But on the other hand, I would uh, argue uh, that we should, on a higher level of abstraction, um, uh, move towards the understanding of the far right as a sort of you know, anti-democratic and anti-social in a sense of anti-egalitarian attempts at a solution of the systemic contradictions without actually endangering uh, the system. So it's an anti-democratic and anti-egalitarian uh, solution inside the system. And in this regard, what is needed to counter this uh, far-right threat is exactly to opposite, and that in fact implies, you know, a democratic and egalitarian solution, and even if it's in fact against the system. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. We have uh, time for a few questions, and also, as, as yesterday, we will continue the debate in the general discussion of Renaud, so now a few questions, Andrea and the argument. I won't be present in the general debate, so I want to ask this question now. I, uh, can you explain uh, the the HDZ, uh, like shift that happened re last week in European Parliament where, uh, uh, with regard to Poland, when HDZ, uh, Europe member parliaments, uh, shifted from uh, Christian Democrats, uh, uh, where they usually, to a group uh, they usually belong to, to the more extreme right, and uh, and uh, can you uh, put that in context with Plenković's alleged fights here in Croatia to to curb the the most right wing uh, of the HDZ? Um, well, I think it's um, we could make a, a grave mistake of uh, trying to overinterpret the ideological. Um, fights or um, how to say this arguments inside the Croatian political parties I mean why over interpret because I think it's very difficult to find a coherent political strategy inside them which is um, a sort of um, a, a regional or a regional positioning or an original po political idea inside I think that there were some um, in, in uh, Hadeze, specifically, 
uh, there were some ideas about um, uh, how to say to uh, move Croatia um, more um, to no no uh, to um, especially in the last few years especially with the president not to complicate the, the issue issue too much there were uh, some uh, romantic nationalists that thought that uh, I, uh, ideas of uh, making this a uh, uh, central uh, of stronger ties with the central European countries uh, is um, a good long-term strategy for, for Croatia. But this sort of strategy, I think it doesn't have anything to do with uh, developmental concepts. I think it has very much to do with this sort of anti-Yugoslav sentiment, which is this sort of central European uh, um, Closer integration is a sort of reaction to the idea of uh, regional uh, cooperation in, in the Balkans. So I don't think it's a shift uh, in, in this regard. I, I don't see any uh, um, expressions of uh, ideological shifts in this regard. I think it's just a continuation of this romantic nationalist notions of uh, Croatia being a non-Balkan uh, country. And I think this is also illustrated by the fact that none of these moves towards Central Europe have been um, completed. And the, uh, the thing you mentioned, that the uh, HDZ refusal to uh, vote against uh, in condemnation of, of Poland, this was actually reversed afterwards. So they originally, they originally uh, together with Vides, voted not to sanction, sanction Poland and uh, afterwards reverse their uh, position, which is, I think, also like an anecdotal good illustration of the fact that uh, they don't have this, uh, th there is no, still no strong uh, ideological or, you know, this strategical uh, reorientation on, uh, on the level that it happened in Central European countries. And the second part of the question with regard to Serbia, don't you think that Lučić's uh, agenda to, to the uh, European agenda as an uh, absolute priority is a slight uh, contradiction with uh, regard to his Russian uh, agenda, you know, because he, he, uh, he uh, since uh, Serbia is not a part of the EU, they didn't have to introduce sanctions to Russia, but also they keep having uh, all the army militaries uh, uh, exercises together and also uh, absorbing Russian capital as well as uh, European one. So don't you think it's, you know, I think it's just uh, Vucic's play. I, I'm not sure that he's like 100% behind of what he says. I, I, I mean, maybe Irena will talk about the Russian question more. I, I've never quite, to be quite honest, I've never uh, seen this uh, folkloric uh, Russian connections as, as so important as to define the strategy political and development strategy of Serbia. I don't see it, of course. I mean, they can uh, make uh, military, joint military parades with Russia. And uh, of course, I mean, some of the uh, privatization, especially the oil industry, in a specific moment was, um, the, the oil industry was given to, to Russian capital. But I don't really see it, especially in the long term, as having a, uh, such an uh, important impact as to make the development of Serbia as something specific in this post-Yugoslav context. But maybe Irena can speak about this, about Serbia later. I don't know if she will. Yeah. <clears throat> I have two or three points. Actually, I would like to start with your historical part of the dissolution of Yugoslavia. I just want to remember, I mean, that Around the same time, another country not very far from here disagreed, disintegrated as well, that is Czechoslovakia. I mean, it was in more or less 25 years ago, 1992. And now, I mean, the recognition of Croatia has been uh, celebrated in a certain way. And in, uh, in Czechos or Czech Republic and Slovakia, more in Slovakia, it is the disintegration of Slovakia or, or Czech of Czechoslovakia is discussed. And there was an interesting short article by uh, a liberal uh, literary, uh, literary uh, 
scientist who was a political actor at that time. And he said uh, the main factor was the control of the privatization process. That in the end, in the end, the disintegration was about that. And <clears throat> for me, that is the most, actually the most plausible uh, explanation of the, of the split of, of Czechoslovakia. In some respects, I mean, the 1980s were different in Czechoslovakia from, from Yugoslavia because you had convergence. And in the late 1980s, actually, the Slovak GDP was almost the Czech level. So one of the very few examples of successful, centrally planned uh, convergence process. And, but with the, crisis, with the capitalism and then with the uh, transformation crisis, I mean, the Slovak economy was much more heavily hit by that. Unemployment increased much more rapidly in Slovakia. Disindustrialization occurred much more rapidly in Slovakia. So that uh, these processes, so that divergence occurred again, I mean, that was part of the, of the background. But uh, I would say the basic reason, and I would see, there I would see a strong parallel with Yugoslavia, control of the privatization process by the parts of the Republican uh, leaderships. Yeah. And so far, political economic factors obviously are playing uh, a central role. What is similar in both cases is actually that towards the end uh, of the common state, there were diverging positions on the future constitutional order and no agreement on that. Uh. And population was not necessarily in favor of complete disintegration. And that, I would say, there is a parallel as well. And in that regard, I would see a parallel with the EU presently as well, because we have those debates about changing the treaties or not changing the treaties and the different, uh, different options. And I would say behind that is as well different political economic options. And so far, I would regard the EU being uh, on the, uh, on the way towards more disintegration, obviously. And I would say, not, from my point of view, not reversible. <clears throat> and finally, I would make a few additions on the present debates in, uh, in the Visegrad Vish countries. There is one dividing line in the EU that did not exist in the European, uh, that did not exist in Yugoslavia. And that is that you have several currencies in one, uh, in one, in one block, and you have the Eurozone and you have non Eurozone countries. And for me, that is a very big dividing line actually in the EU. The one that is not uh, acknowledged as such or not so deeply acknowledged as such. And this dividing line, I mean, cuts through the Visegrad countries as well, because there's one country, that is Slovakia, that is a member of the Eurozone. And actually, the Slovak government, mostly Social Democrat of, of Smea and two other parties, clearly pronounces that it wants to be part of the core, and that is of the Eurozone. Mm. And in the other three countries, the debate is more complicated. In the Czech Republic, there are actually two now small parties that are in favor of accelerating, accelerating the way to the Eurozone, that is the Social Democrats, and that is a small liberal uh, formation, a uh, top uh, zero, zero, nine. Yeah? So, <clears throat> and in Poland, it is as well the extra parliamentary social democrats that, that are in favor of uh, joining the Eurozone. For me, it is very interesting to see that the social democrats are in favor of, Euro, of joining the Eurozone. I mean, though in the Eurozone, the constraints for social policies, etc., are even stronger than. Uh, being outside the Eurozone. In addition, I mean, the integration of the Eurozone implies that the last existing protective mechanism, that is devaluation of the currency, it disappears. Uh -huh. And at the same time, at the margins of the Social Democrats, it is an acknowledged, or there's an incipient debate that the development model based on FDI and low wages uh, has reached limits and it will not continue and cannot continue as it is. So I would say there is a contradiction in social demo in that case in social democracy. Mm -hmm. And regarding uh, the different forces of the 
nationalist right that are not in favor of joining the core. Partially, the rationality is to have more parameters to radicalize the dependent development model. That, for me, would be the idea of Občanska Demokratická Strana, for example, to have more parameters for radicalizing the model. That would, that would be the idea of Sloboda and uh, Solidarita as well. And in the case of peace, I would say their position is more ambiguous. Uh, and Poland has a bit more options because it is a, has a bigger domestic market and domestic capital is more important as well. Mm. So far, I would not see the Visegrad countries as being too homogeneous. There is a, I would say there is an important dividing line <coughs> inside the Visegrad countries as, as well. Mm. And finally, on your final comments, I would totally agree that uh, the nationalist right is about being rightist, that is being in favor of inequality, and that it is uh, authoritarian in its orientation. But how the authoritarianism is expressed, it differs. At times it is technocratic authoritarianism, and at times I would say it is a more traditional type uh, of authoritarianism. And how to deal with those different forces, I think it's important as well to deal with the specifics, as specific expressions, yeah, to be able to confront them tactically in a way that is appropriate for the specific case. You go to something? No, no. <laughs> it's all in place. A bit of a different subject matter. Um, and this is something I probably I'm mentioning now, not because I expect that you that this can be resolved easily, but it's more like bookmarking it maybe for the la debate later. But of course, you can also uh, answer now. I mean, this was not, of course, something you focused on explicitly, but this was something that seemed to be implicit in the, uh, in the your choice of, of, of uh, words in certain points. That is the underlying, uh, how should I say, the underlying. Uh, theoretical understanding or of your notion of, of uh, uh, ideology or nationalism as an ideology, because you said uh, several times um, its purposes is or its functions are, and in the context of, let's say, uh, what you mentioned about the regional divergence of regional development in um, Slovakia, or uh, if I remember correctly, you said that uh, nationalism here serves as some sort of ideological. Uh, Either, uh, either compensation or fig leaf uh, um, for the effect of, of, the, the verge of, a, of a divergence of economic development in terms of invoking, I don't know, the nation as, as a homogeneous entity, which would, would uh, in this context, uh, not uh, express the reality of divergent development adequately. So the, the, the question is then, um, have I understood you correctly here? What, what, uh, if you said its purpose is, what precisely did you mean in that sense? Uh, as a fig leaf, as a, as a some sort of a compensation or whatnot? And more on, on a more general level, well, or on a more theoretical level, talk of purpose, of course, suggests intentionality, which then uh, poses the question, oh, what, what is the subject intending? Um, uh, or if, um, and this seems to, at times to suggest, of course, this was not, again, I say, it may be not entirely fair uh, to imply this, but it, 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 uh, because this was not the main focus of your uh, argument, but uh, for some readers, at least, uh, it, uh, in some readings, I, I guess it can suggest a manipulative view of ideology as something top-down, which would then also suggest maybe an underlying, which would be uh, complementary with a certain traditional Marxist view of nationalism or, or other ideologies as, in that sense, uh, predominantly uh, uh, the result of top-down manipulation, like uh, strictly as a class instrument, and in that sense uh, that the authentic, you know, uh, in, in terms of denying its authenticity, especially the authenticity of its mass appeal. And I think, I'm not saying that you're, uh, that you, you're arguing along those lines, but insofar as they can be maybe uh, read in your uh, choice of, of terms, uh, I would suggest that this is something maybe that simplifies or rather, uh, or, or overemphasizes 
this functionalist aspect of, of nationalism, uh, but uh, maybe if one phrases it in terms of uh, its effects, it has ideological effects it produces, or even the ex uh, uh, raises the question what it does express uh, express uh, in terms of uh, also on the pop on in terms of interest and cravings uh, on on the popular level, you get maybe a. Uh, where we are a bit more removed from the potential accusation of a, a functionalist or um, instrumentalist, uh, strictly instrumentalist understanding of na nationalism. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, um, part of the reason why you can uh, make this, um, no comment, but uh, remark. yes, what, remark, but, but uh, why some of the things I said. Uh, may seem in such regard as this um, as a sort of uh, vulgar uh, materialism i mean is the exactly uh, b because i actually attempted to contrast to um, to provide a, um, to, to to illustrate a contract uh, con uh, contrast towards the other types of mainstream interpretations of nationalism and that is exactly, you know, this sort of mentality, uh, eternal, unchangeable uh, hatreds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, in this regard, I uh, somehow specifically tried to emphasize uh, its uh, 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 material uh, uh, material uh, sources. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's uh, the question of ideology is much, much more. Um, co complex and complicated, but uh, what I would, I, I wouldn't, um, not just in terms of nationalism, but you know, also religion and different uh, types of, uh, uh, you know, um, um, false consciousness. I would, uh, um, I, I think it's. It can serve as a slogan, but not as a explication to call it, you know, just um, uh, uh, a fig leaf or um, how to say. Um, as I, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, it's in, on an explanatory level, it's very useful to consider nationalism just as a sort of ploy to. Um, how to say to hide to to um, to to stop the development of uh, class consciousness of, or something like this. But on the other hand, uh, uh, so on one hand, I would ne I, I wouldn't claim that it's a sort of a big uh, scheme or a conspiracy to 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 change the way the people are thinking so as to. Uh, fulfill the concrete material interest by some invisible uh, elite of one class or something like this, uh, this classic conspiracy theory um, ideas. But on the other hand, I think also that we have to, exp uh, um, um, have to accept that nationalism is in fact a, a political, uh, is a political project. It's not a um, spontaneous, um, how to say, uh, it doesn't come out of s spontaneous uh, attempts to um, uh, to understand the world around you. It's a, it's a very specific uh, uh, political uh, project, which uh, has its implication in the distribution of power between classes. Uh, and it is useful not uh, it is useful because it, in the uh, current um, society, uh, fulfills some some um, useful functions to part of some classes, and it doesn't only include, you know, the ruling class. This uh, nationalism is not only the instrument of the ruling <laughs> class. Occasionally, nationalism can serve as a useful expression of uh, working class uh, material interest in the sense that it can uh, give them at least um, a sense of solidarity and sometimes and also an I uh, instrument to fight uh, to fight for uh, solidarity in the context of uh, of a joint of a common nation 
So, I mean, in this regard, um, yeah, I mean, um, I think this um, big dilemma about, uh, well, you know, if it's just a project of, of, uh, of uh, the bourgeoisie to uh, stop us feeling ourselves and as workers and um, um, consider ourselves to be a part of the same nation with, uh, which, uh, with our uh, bourgeoisie. Um, on the one hand, so if this is the uh, explanation, and on the other hand, you have uh, visible, spontaneous expressions of uh, national sentiment among the working classes themselves, even if it's this is supposed to be something foreign, uh, inherently foreign to them. I think this sort of contradiction can be explained by the fact that in different situation, it is exactly uh, the national sentiment that can be used as a, as a sort of... Uh, Language of articulation of interests yes, on both yes. sides. Yes, 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 exactly, yes, sorry. I'm a bit uh, tired with uh, all the English, so that's why it talks so, so, so slow. But yeah, I mean, in, I think this is very, very visible in the popularity of the um, of, of the Central European uh, rightists, but also, I mean, here also, right-wing uh, national parties, parties here. I mean, it's it can be um, by by the working class itself. It can be seen <coughs> as a sort of yes expression to defend this their own material. I mean, th this is the all the discussion uh, in Croatia now about oh why uh, on every protest you know the uh, the workers uh, carry flags and say oh but we are croats why why are we treated like this etc etc yeah i mean because it is a reference you know being part of the same nation for them is is a legitimate reference it's the only only um, uh, articulation that they see as a is a useful in the current struggle with the bourgeoisie you know they uh, they consider it as a um, as a tool, you know, to um, to articulate their their demands, their their sense of entitlement to uh, certain uh, social rights is explained is explained by them by being part of a nation, not a, as a class. Okay. I want just to add something, but. Uh, it's a uh, it's very valuable uh, lecture you give in. I like your entry points concerning development politics. In fact, uh, in context of explaining uh, rising of nationalism on these spaces, I would agree with uh, Joachim that uh, privatization processes uh, is somehow stemmed up from the will to control the the entire process in order to install. I, I may I may I may say about the Serbian case, in order to install uh, <clears throat> firstly uh, import oriented economy, uh, to completely dismantle the, six, the exi existing sectorial composition of the industry existing industry, <clears throat> which led to exploding of rate of unemployment. And the politics of development uh, based on FDIs, in fact, contributed the entire processes because when, because most of the FDIs who entered in Serbia was due to privatization processes, uh, which led to massive layoffs, etc. Et <clears throat> but on the other hand, what what is what is very visible uh, in Serbian society is connected uh, mostly with this uh, portfolio investment, credit politics. Uh, emission of securities, government bonds, public debt, etc. <clears throat> I would like if you, if you can add something about it, because what uh, this restrictive monetary politics in, the, uh, in Serbia especially, but also in the countries uh, in the region, uh, is serving for is uh, that it sucked out all the uh, liquidity surpluses and domestic industry cannot work. In Serbia, you have an example that most than uh, 100,000 uh, uh, enterprises, their accounts are blocked more than six months, in fact. 
and this is uh, this gave rise to this uh, nationalistic uh, nationalistic sentiments because foreign banks are bad; they suck out uh, the the money from you know our economy, etc., etc. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I'm I'm really not the, the best uh, person to to add this to this sort of uh, argument, but I accept that um, it's a uh, like interesting, as, especially with this uh, sort of anti-banking uh, mm. rhetoric um, in well, not just in the Eastern Europe, you know, in the, uh, in Italy also, and so it's uh, it's an, an interesting aspect. But I think you know much more about this than, than I do. So I mean, it's it's more of a task for you to to fill in these gaps than, than for me. Yeah, I know, especially that in Croatia, this amount of this repurchase of uh, security of central bank is also the main monetary politics in order to attract speculative capital. In fact, they're not. This capital is not directed into productive sector, real sector. Mm -hmm. It came only into the economy to be, uh, you know, to be increased by the interest and then leave the country. In Serbia, this amount of rep operation exploded throughout the years because of a monetary politics that we have and a very high benchmark interest rate. It was 70% uh, at 2010. I suppose. I don't know what's the, the benchmark interest rate in Croatia, but this serves as a wheel how to attract speculative capital not entering into the real sector and leave out the economy. For one more question. Um, and in your expose, you referred actually to the political and the economical reasons for the phenomena. We are talking about the, the nationalism. But actually, um, and then you are referring also to the ruling class and to the working class. Um, in order to be complete, actually, to take the uh, entire phenomena into consideration, I, I believe that we should take into account all the aspects and also all the social stratas, uh, including, of course, the middle classes, and also the other aspects. For example, as we spoke only about the economy and politics in this context, I, 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 sh I believe that we should mention also the other aspects, such as a cultural and linguistic. And so if we consider all the cases of the disappearance of multinational uh, um, states or federations, like the Soviet Federation, like the uh, Czechoslovak Federation, like the Yugoslav Federation, and now we have the recent example with the uh, case of the Spanish state. In all these cases, we were also exposed, and that was all necessarily on the agenda of the right-wing uh, movements. We were always exposed to the phenomena of the, of the cultural and the linguistic discrimination, which went up to such extremes as in the Soviet Union, although theoretically the nations composing the Soviet Federation were constitutionally equal, but in practice it, uh, it went up to the extermination of the uh, non-Russian cultures and languages, up to the point that some languages were at the edge of disappearance. For example, Baltic languages, Latvian, for example, was practically in the, in the, in the, at the edge of disappearance. For example, the first May uh, manifestation in Tallinn at the end of the 80s was, uh, was uh, managed exclusively in Russian language. So the theoretical state language of the Soviet Republic of Estonia was even not used in a single second. And we have a similar, uh, but a lesser degree uh, uh, examples in the case of Czechoslovakia, where Czech language was uh, superposed to the Slovak. We had the same case in Yugoslavia, where Serb language was dominant. All the Croats understand the Serbian without problem, but we, were, we had such an atmosphere in the 80s is, perhaps the younger ones do not remember that, but which was which really uh, pushed uh, the water to the nationalist uh, uh, mill in, in, in the case of Croatia. It was much more case in the case of Slovenia. And then as the last example, uh, at least in Europe, for example, I, I lived for 20 years in Belgium. The question of the Dutch language uh, 
previously called Flemish, but is ex of extreme, of utmost importance. And in the case of Catalonia's present Spanish state does not recognize the lingual equality of its citizens. So it constitutionally imposes the imperial language, which is Castilian, and just the other languages, Catalonian, Basquian, Valencian, and Galician, are being recognized as a regional mean of, of uh, communication. But they are not uh, constitutionally equal as, for example, four federal languages in Yugoslavia were Serbian, Croatian, Slovenian, and Macedonian. So that's, what, that's my point. So I do agree that the economy and politics and uh, uh, diplomacy and traditions, uh, history, etc., are important elements. But we always should also consider the language and the culture. Because usually in the left-wing movements, it's always neglected, as it would be inexistent. But it is existent, and I know the case, for example, of Quebec, where I was also, where, for example, the fight for the survival of the French language was essential, and which led to two referendums for the for the independence. So. In, in conclusion, I believe that we should consider everything and not automatically consider that, for example, language and culture are not important. Mm. Well, I agree very much that uh, linguistics and cultural differences are very important to understand the specific con uh, national con conflicts in a certain country. But I think they are much better explained and understood as expressions and not the causes of the conflicts themselves. I mean, of course, uh, many of the uh, examples you, um, uh, you mentioned, not to go into uh, their uh, specific accuracy or, or interpretations, I think all, uh, already provide an, an interesting uh, counter argument. Like, for instance, you, as I understood, you implicitly claimed that it was the linguistic conflict between Croatian and Serbian, that's one of the causes for the disappearance of uh, uh, Yugoslavia, dissolution of Yugoslavia. But at the same time, you could argue basically that in 1918, the differences between standard Croatian and Serbian were in fact significantly more uh, uh, stronger. And that time was in fact the period of uh, the highest, biggest popularity of the Yugoslav idea. In this, the the uh, uh, the the, the national uh, Serbo-Croatian ethnic conflicts were perhaps at this lowest period in uh, in the period of uh, forming uh, forming Yugoslavia, even if the linguistic differences were were uh, much higher. Something similar can also be uh, said about the Soviet case. If the Soviet Union disappeared. Uh, uh, partly uh, because of the uh, dissatisfaction of the smaller nations with the dominance of uh, Russian. I mean, we should also take into account that early Soviet period was marked by exactly the, the, the opposite uh, process. So the early Soviet uh, government had a very uh, strong uh, policy of Koreanization, you know, to ex exactly to reverse the consequence of uh, uh, Tsarist Russia um, linguistic policies, which were uh, the dominance of standard Russian. And so in the uh, late 20s, at the height of Koreanization politics, the, uh, it didn't bring to, uh, to the solution of the Soviet uh, Union this, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, strengthening of, of uh, different uh, lingu of the li linguistic di diversity of this country. So I think while we cannot understand these things without uh, concentrating on specific issues like the linguistic issues, uh, they also often prove to be inadequate as uh, to explain the root causes of the crisis purely by its manifestations, like linguistic discussions or, or cultural conflicts. So that would be my opinion. Of course, this is not something I can empirically prove um, easily, but I think that some historical uh, examples point us to, towards different, uh, different and materialist uh, explanations as, as more adequate. Okay. Um, thank you, Nicole. We now go to finish. We are already 20 minutes uh, late. 
So as you all know, we will at uh, half past three we will uh, continue with the Iranian lecture on the far new far right in Serbia, and also with uh, after 15 minutes break at 5:15 we will continue this discussion also integrate the, the points uh, in, in, in Iran's lecture. So thank you once again and see you in the afternoon.